Well, good morning, Watershed. Good morning. All right. <laughs> Y'all are the most special, beautiful group of people I've ever been around, and that includes my prison time. So, y'all are, y'all are the deal. Thank y'all. Thank you for that music. Thank you, Austin, for what you shared. Everything's already been so beautiful. We can go home now, but I need some attention, so we're going to stay for 30 more minutes. Okay, good morning. My name is Kim Honeycutt, and I am a psychotherapist, trauma recovery consultant, and now also I'm part of the teaching team here at Watershed. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that impromptu, <laughs> organic, warm response to that. Thank you. I love being part of Watershed. Uh, so my, let me tell you my day job real quick first, though. So I'm a psychotherapist. Let me tell you what that means. I have this amazing privilege to be a part of someone's journey as they walk along and learn how to step in to have who they actually are. How to get out of their old story and be a part of a new story that God has for them. How to learn to be authentic. It is the absolute best job in the world. I love doing it. And part of my niche, what I love to do is talk about the intersection of psychology and theology. So I get to do that here with you today. But before I do that, I have two confessions. And I'm going to start with just one. And this is, this is biblical. This is part of James. So just let you know, I'm doing something biblical at Watershed. So, and this may already be obvious. You might be able to look at me and tell this already, what I'm about to say. No, not that. We've already come out about that. Not that. That's not it. That's not it. My confession is, is that I'm, I'm no longer cool. I'm not cool. And I, maybe I never was, but I really thought I was cool. And I'm not anymore. I see, I found out about this thing. I just learned about this about three weeks ago. You may have already known about this thing called Tic Tac Toe, this app, this Tiki Talk video thingy, the Tic Tac thing, whatever that people are doing. And, and the reason I found out is that on Instagram, you can't just post anymore, right? It can't be words. Everything's a video. Everything's a reel. And so I saw this woman, and I just didn't have a choice. It just, it's just there. And so she started talking, and she took time, and she said, hey, I want to thank Maddie Zom for, for being so authentic, being so real in her lyrics. And since I'm not cool, I don't know who this Maddie person is. So I Googled her. And what came up was a song she wrote. And it's called You Might Not Like Her. And I feel like this was a God wink. So I want to read to you the first part of these lyrics. This is Maddie. You might not like her. If you would have told me I'd throw away my purity ring in the middle of an airport, my younger self would laugh. Would never believe that. It's against everything that we stood for. She'd hate that I smoked weed and cussed frequently, and she'd try to convert everyone I call a bestie. Next part, please. You'll throw shots in the dark and black out at a bar. There'll be good and there'll be bad parts. Someday you'll kiss a girl and you'll panic. Someday you'll, some guy will break your heart and you will feel manic. Then you'll learn to let people have their opinions and talk about your traumas and like the body you live in. Someday you'll learn to keep your own secrets. Say you're doing okay and really mean it. You'll lose your faith a bit and question if she's you. For a while, you might not like her, but I do. So that song resonates with me. And I can, I can hear so much in this. I can hear her new self talking to her younger self. I can hear her new self trying to help the old self reconcile what they were taught and what actually is truthful for her and what she could actually trust and who can she trust now. I can hear her struggle. I can even hear what I'm going to guess what the scriptures are that were taught to her. And I think these scriptures are beautiful, and I think a lot of us have had someone misinterpret those. 
And when scripture is misinterpreted, we misapply it. I can hear her being believing at parts of her life that there should be death of self, that she should deny herself, that there should be all decrease of self, that anything about self is wrong. And when there is an absence of self, in that void we put behavior. And I can hear that's what she did. And if you, you know my story, you know that that's what happened to me and happens to so many of us. That part of my, my walk has been how to reconcile that culturally and society and in families and in churches, I've been told that any connection to self is selfish. And so a lot of times, if you met me, you didn't meet me, you met a trauma response. You didn't meet me, you met a survival strategy, you met productivity, you met performance, you met perfectionism. I didn't know how to connect to myself or you, so I had a relationship with food in a disordered way. I knew how to have a relationship with alcohol, not with you. I knew how to have a relationship with self mutilation I didn't know how to connect to myself to you, and there was no way I understood how to connect to God. And so this is why I'm so excited about this series and being able to share with you. This is why this is so important. See, I truly believe that we are on a growth path. We're called to grow and grow in love. And anything that you neglect cannot grow. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17, we're taught that therefore anyone in Christ, anyone who belongs to Christ, they will be a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. To belong is an emotional need. It is evidence of accumulation of emotional needs have been met, they've been fulfilled, and there's a connection. And because of that, you have a sense of belonging. And emotional needs are things like, I need to be seen. I need to be heard. I need to feel important. And most of all, I need to feel safe. And that means I need to know that I can be safely seen. Those are emotional needs. You see, so many of us who grew up in some type of environment to be at the table was just about fitting in. We had to say certain things to stay at the table, not say certain things to stay at that table. We had to act certain ways or not act certain ways. In a very inauthentic way, it was more survival strategy just so we could fit in at the table. And if you have emotional needs, and we all do, and they aren't seen, and then on top of that, someone even shames you for having those emotional needs. You don't know you're worthy to be at the table, much less worthy to belong to Jesus. And so that's why we have to figure out how do we look at the old story? How do we get an understanding of our old self? And the scripture tells us to behold. And behold means that you have a different perspective, that you're able to see something differently than how it originally came in. And in order for us to be new, to have new ideas, a new understanding of our sense of self, in order for us to be able to have that, then we have to have permission to actually look at ourselves. To have permission to connect to ourselves. See, if we're separate from ourselves, we're also separate from love. And that means you're actually living and walking in the very definition of trauma. So let me unpack trauma for a second. And there's a, a lot of therapists here who could probably do a better job than I can on this. And you've probably watched those tic-tac-toes about trauma. So you've, <laughs> you probably already have an understanding. But let me unpack this for a second. So trauma means disconnection. Disconnection from self. Disconnection from safety. It means something came into your life at some point that you did not have internal resources for. It was beyond your capacity. And so a lot of therapists talk about little T's and big T's. Little traumas, big traumas. And I understand that. I understand we need to classify it. But I, I, want, you to, I want you to hear this. That when we do that and say little T and big T, you will now actually probably stay in your old story because you will decide, no matter what, that your trauma is a little T, so there's no point in looking at it. So I think it's really important that we not compare. Trauma is trauma. Pain 
is pain. And so just to understand what they actually mean by little t is that there are single incident traumatic events. And so let's say a car accident, and I'm not saying this to trigger you in any way, but let's just say a simple car accident, just because you're on 77, that's just what happens, right? No one got hurt, nothing happened, but your car got damaged, and so you're inconvenienced. So that's a single incident trauma. But now the idea of getting on the interstate causes you to go into your old story. Your body re-experiences what you already experienced. You can go into your old story. So that's the threat. It's been on the interstate. For other of us, we have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's many different branches of that. I'm just going to talk today about relationship trauma as a complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm talking about relationship trauma because I believe, and this is probably an underscore, I believe 99.9% .9 of us have relationship trauma. If you are breathing and have family members, <laughs> if you're a watershed, there's a possibility. So, and this is why this is so important for us, to be able to, to look at this and be able to have a chance of coming into a new creation, be able to look at this differently, behold it differently. Is that complex PTSD means that you're disconnected from self, safety, and trust. It means your emotional needs, particularly as a child, from attachment figures, authority, people who are very important. It could be a, it could be a spouse as an adult, but particularly as children, the people who are there to show up for us, if they don't see our emotional needs, and then, as I said earlier, they shame you for even having the emotional needs. That is complex PTSD. And we learn to be separate from ourselves. With the car, the threat is the interstate. For those of us who have relationship trauma, the threat is connection to self. The threat is being in a relationship with you. And so we constantly stay in behavior, and it becomes about being attached to tasks instead of being connected to people. We actually get taught, and this is happening through Scripture, we actually get taught that it's, not about who we are to each other, but what we can do for each other. I just don't think that's godly. And so there's, there's scripture that's, that's teaching us to actually stay separate from who we are. That is trauma. So David spoke a few weeks ago, and he talked about a lot of us are taught, particularly as children, that the definition of salvation is being saved from self. And he gave us different ideas of that. Because, again, that means that you aren't allowed to be self, that something's wrong with self. And so I'm just going to tell you my definition of salvation is I believe I've been saved to be in the process of being introduced to myself, to my true self, to how God sees me and experiences me. And I think the evidence of this are the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, or your mind, or your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I think the greatest commandment telling us to love with our heart, our mind, and our soul, I think that is clarity that we have to have a sense of self. And that sense of self is what builds to the second greatest commandment because that means that we have a responsibility to have agency over self. So that when we show up for a neighbor, we show up for the neighbor. Yeah. So let me unpack a little bit about heart, mind, and soul. And the science that goes behind when it comes to trust and attachment. So your, your heart or your emotional needs. What we talked about earlier, and you need to be seen safely. And when those types of emotional needs, and these are for your whole life, when they are met, someone fulfills them, then that creates trust with that person, and that is the connection. That we have to be seen, and we have to be heard, and have a sense of belonging. And then our soul has many interpretations, but many of us believe that your soul is actually intuition. And this is being taught to trust yourself, which means you have to do your own emotional needs. You have to see yourself, hear yourself, interact with yourself in a way that you can trust your body, that you can trust your own gut. And the mind 
And just so you know, the mind and the brain are two separate things. And don't ask me more than that. I'm not smart enough to tell you anything <laughs> beyond that. They're just two separate things. They have, they have different functionalities. Your mind is your regulator. It's there for awareness. And inside of our mind, we get to do this amazing thing called mentalization. But to be able to do the mentalization, I'm going to tell you what it is. It means you have to have a sense of self and a sense of understanding of your heart and your soul. And that leads to awareness, being able to do mentalization for each other. Mentalization is really cool. What it means is that I hold your mind in mind. I hold your mind in mind. So that when you are sharing with me, I have resolved what's happening inside of me. I'm not making what you're saying to me or what you're going through about me at all because my needs are fulfilled. I can listen to you and hear you from your mind, from what I think it's like for you, and from that place I can ask you questions. As a psychotherapist, this is an invaluable tool. This is a beautiful thing to be a part of. That when someone shares something with me, I'm not looking for them to have a need so I can jump in there and do something for them. Because see, my needs are fulfilled. I don't have to do that. I, I don't need them to experience something the same way I've experienced it. I've got capacity. I have a sense of self. I know my heart and my mind and my intuition. And so what they share is about them. I think this is the missing key to being able to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. To let their experience be their experience. It is compassion and empathy with curiosity. And this, that ability to mentalize, that is what leads to people being able to trust us. And all three of these have to do with trust. See, in the world of psychology, we can't do anything simple at all. We just can't. So we don't just say trust. It's called epistemic trust. So when you're able to mentalize, when you're able to be there and be present with somebody, and they have a secure connection with you, and you have a secure connection with yourself, it means that you're listening to me talk. If you have epistemic trust with me, then you will decide what I'm sharing, what's relevant and what's irrelevant. You can filter through it. You can decipher and decide what applies to you and what does not apply to you. It means if I give you new information, you can have your own agency of yourself. You can decide what to take in and what not in order for you to become a new creation. But a lot of us have had situations, especially relationship trauma, where we've had to trust people who aren't trustworthy. So there's two other types of trust that I want to share with you. The first is called hypervigilant trust. Hypervigilant means that my trust has been so broken. My trust meter is just off the charts. And I don't care what you share with me. I'm not taking it in. Nothing new will come in. I will only know and understand what I already know and understand. That I won't trust anything that you say. So nothing new. I don't change at all. I can't look at it or behold it differently. And all of us have epistemic hypovigilant trust. Hypo means that we believe everything. It means all it takes is that you are in the same political party as me and you say something, then I'm just going to take it in. That there's no healthy skepticism. There's no questioning. So when we actually have epistemic trust, we are curious and we can ask questions. We can disagree with someone without losing a sense of stability and security with themselves or with ourselves. They did an experiment, which I think is fascinating. And so they took moms and, and children, pretty fairly young children, and they, they took a group of moms who had secure attachment. It meant that they, they were attuned to their children. They were very aware of their children's emotional needs. And they took some moms that had insecure attachment. And they gave the moms these stuffed animals. And two-thirds of the stuffed animal was a horse. One-third was a cow. And so the mom, the secure mom, would give it to the child, the secure connection with the child, and say, hey, little Larissa. <laughs> they hand it to them and say, this is a cow. And the baby would laugh and say, no, no, it's not mommy. And the baby was allowed to question. 
to laugh about it, to be able to disagree with their mom without stress, something I've never experienced in my life, come to think of it. <laughs> that just hit me. I've never done that. So the moms have insecure attachment with their kids. They would give the child the same stuffed animal, and they would say, this is a cow, and the kids would just stare at them. They would just agree. They wouldn't do anything. There was no room to question. There was no room to mistrust. That when we are in healthy relationships and we're stepping out of relationship trauma and we're able to trust, it means that we explore and we're curious and we decide as we become new creations what new information can come in. So I, don't, I just don't believe that, particularly a lot of us, our initial story, our old story, our first story, our core narrative, I just don't believe that's supposed to be your forever story. And I think one of the stories in the Bible that just captures this so well and speaks about it is the story of the blind man. And so I know a lot of you probably know this. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. So there's this man who's been blind since birth. And Jesus comes along and spits on him, just holy spit, does something that I would go to jail for, but he, he can do this. Throws some holy spit his way. And helps this man now have sight. So this man's been blind his whole life, and now he has sight. Well, the Pharisees hear about this. They call him in front of them to present what was happening. They call his parents in. They can't, they can't take in what's happened. They call this man back in and ask him questions. And this is where we go to John 9, 26. And then they asked him, what did Jesus do to you? How, how did he open your eyes? He answers, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? See, he's standing there in front of them as a new creation. He's standing there as someone who is loving the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, and soul. He's standing there standing on his own evidence, having epistemic trust with Jesus. He doesn't have to trust this people because he trusts himself and he trusts what Jesus just did for him. But see, they are in their old story, so they can't see his new story because it challenges where they are too much. So they hurled insults at him. They said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Some name dropping. We know that God... Spoke to Moses, but for, as for this fellow, Jesus, we don't even know where he comes from. Can you hear the distrust? That all they can do is stand in what they already know. All they can do is trust their life experience. And so if they take in what has happened to this man, that he is a new person, then they would actually have to look at themselves. And they can't do that. We are called to know that we belong. And in that, as we're told in the first commandment, we are beloved. Beloved means there is a deep affection. It's God's tender love for you. And a lot of us have to behold certain things differently before we can really get it, that we belong and we're beloved. So you all know that last year, my wife and I, by the way, I want you all to know there are bets on how many times I'm going to say today, my beautiful wife, Larissa. <laughs> See, the only reason I haven't said it 20 times is because there's money on this. I'm just telling you. So, this thing happened with my beautiful wife, Larissa, and I, and this is my second confession. It's my final confession to you today. That last year when we came out, you all know that my speaking opportunities dried up as a result. And this year, they resurfaced. Some things happened. And so Larissa and I, my beautiful wife, Larissa and I. <laughs> that's three. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I just, I just lost 20 bucks. All right. That's fine. It's worth it to say. We went to one of my first new speaking engagements. We pulled up at the church, and we, we saw the denomination of the church. 
And based on our own post-traumatic stress disorder, what we've been through, we said, uh-oh. <laughs> and so my wife said, my beautiful wife, Larissa, said, to like, she said, just don't introduce me as your wife. I said, okay. So I go in and I do what I love to do, which is share about God. And afterwards, I was talking to a lot of people. And this is my confession. I want you all to know, not only did I not introduce her as my wife, I just didn't introduce her at all. And we got in the car and we talked about how I didn't see her. I didn't hear her. I didn't give her a sense of belonging. And I didn't do any of that for myself either. And we made a decision that I won't go anywhere to speak or go anywhere, period, ever again, that I cannot show up as the new crate I am married to Larissa. <laughs> um, So I want you to know that's post-traumatic growth. We are called to be on a path of growth and to love each other as we love our neighbor and to know that we are beloved by God and to research and look at our hearts, our souls and minds so we can stand firm in front of anybody knowing that we are worthy of being beloved. You know, a lot of us are leaving here today and going to the parade. And if you're not going, you're going to go into a corporate boardroom or you're going to go see your family. You're going to go somewhere where somebody is going to hurl insults at you. And that's going to happen to us today. And we're going to stand there knowing that we belong to the God who created the whole world in six days. That we know who we've been called to be and we're going to stand there proudly knowing that there is no shame being a new creation. That who we are, who we are, gives us the name of chosen. We get to be called beloved and we belong. So there are some people today that might not like us, but we do. We do. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you. I thank you that we are called to behold and to see some horrible things we've been through, to see it differently. So that we can see ourselves the way that you see us. I thank you that we get to have new experiences today. And more importantly, the new has come. The old has passed away. And there's no insult, there's no words and no action that can take away the love that you have for us. God, I thank you as we're in this journey, there may be times that we don't even like ourselves, but I thank you that you always do. It's in your son's name these things are prayed. Amen.